Uh, now, in this uh, lecture, we are going to discuss the classification and description of uh, consonants. And I want to begin by the question of the short, brief uh, labels for consonants. Uh, a lot of this information is on your handout, incidentally, so you don't have to write it all down. You see here the brief uh, descriptive uh, labels. These are usually two or three terms. The first of these the components of the label is voicing. And this answers the question, are the vocal folds buzzing? The vocal folds here in the uh, voice box inside the, uh, 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 the throat here, uh, if we want the technical term, we refer to the space between the vocal folds as the glottis. So this refers to the state of the glottis. Um, and this is merely, we say, voiced or voiceless, but we can replace this by fortis and lenis, and indeed for a language like English is a sensible thing to do. We then move on to place of articulation. Again, a simple question, where in the vocal tract, where uh, in the tube above the lungs going to, uh, out through the lips, all this complicated uh, tube uh, which we term the vocal tract, uh, where in the vocal tract is the sound made? Lastly, we have manner of articulation, and this answers the question, how is the sound made? And we'll move on to uh, discuss uh, all these uh, things. Let's take the first one then, voiced, voiceless, are the terms we use, versus fortis lenis. This is a phonetic distinction. Are the vocal folds buzzing? So it uh, answers that actual question. Voiced and voiceless, uh, refers to that. If you say an S, say an S, and then say a Z, and you can if you want to, if you want to hear this very clearly, put your fingers in your ears. No, not that far into your ears. Uh, so say S, then Z, And you can hear the buzzing. You all sounded like a set of bumblebees, actually. Uh, you can hear the buzzing for the uh, Z there quite easily. This is a phonetic distinction. It uh, refers to something uh, physical, as it were. Fortis Venus, on the other hand, uh, is, is a phonological thing. It includes several uh, features which are uh, bundled uh, together, as it were. <coughs> we can also include uh, other items in uh, our description. We can include modifications, for instance, to the consonants we're going to call stop consonants. So we have aspiration, a little puff of air that one has. If I say a word like pin or indeed puff, then you can hear this little uh, escape of air as I produce that sound. Uh, this happens where you have a, a P, T, or K, so under the stop, uh, sorry, under the, the uh, closer consonants in initial position in the syllable. We also have modifications like glottalization, uh, the little catch in the throat that you have. For instance, in a word like button or written. So the uh, effect here, the vocal folds snapping together and stopping the air momentarily uh, as it comes, the airstream comes from the lungs. Very characteristic of present day uh, British English. And in the next lecture uh, on Monday, I'll go on to examine that in uh, rather more uh, rather more uh, detail. Um, what, uh, in fact, do we mean by uh, terms uh, like fortis lenis? Let me go back to that slide for a second. Uh, fortis lenis also, uh, is uh, a term which we get from uh, Latin. Fortis means strong, lenis means soft or weak. And the uh, various uh, features which are uh, contained within it, you can see summarized on your handout. As I said, I won't talk about these in great detail now because we'll come back to it uh, when we uh, talk about English consonants, an overview of English consonants uh, in the next, uh, in my next lecture. But you can see here that we say the articulation is in all respects stronger and more energetic for Fortis. For Linus, the articulation is weaker. The articulation is voiceless for fortis. For lenis, the articulation has potential voice. 
The closest PTK, I've already covered this, have a brief puff of air called aspiration. Initial plosives are unaspirated in the case of leaves. Fortis, vowels are shortened before a final fortis consonant. So a word like beat has a brief clipped vowel. We call that effect. Uh, John Wells' term has become used worldwide now, pre-fortis uh, clipping. Uh, vowels before Linus consonants have full length, so this gives us D. Uh, if you women say that, you can hear the effect quite easily. Say, uh, here, beat, everybody. Short vowel, and then B. And the vowel lengthens. Only before the fortis is it uh, clipped. Uh, syllable final glottal stops uh, have, uh, so, sorry, syllable, syllable final stops often have a reinforcing glottal stop. We call that effect pre glottalization so if I say, uh, she bit me, she bit me, I'm referring to a cat, not my wife, I must point out, uh, then I have that reinforcing bottle stop there on the teeth. Bid me something, my notes, uh, then I uh, don't have any bottle stop. Um, so then you can see that with Fortis we have a whole set of things uh, which are included. And so it's a convenient label for all these features. For um, some languages, uh, one would find that voiced and voiceless was perfectly adequate. For French, for example, <coughs> for Spanish. But for English, voicing, as we will see, because I'll come back to voicing at the end, voicing is not the beginning and end of uh, consonant description. You have to say a lot about uh, voicing in English for it to be uh, covered uh, adequately. This then uh, gives you the distinction that we have here then between uh, fortis and lenus. And we're going to move on now to our next matter. And that is the question of place of articulation. But before we deal with it, we need to talk about two types of articulator. We can distinguish between an active articulator, that is to say the part of the speech mechanism that moves during an articulation, and a passive articulator. The passive articulator is the part that stays still. It's the target of the articulation. When we construct our brief uh, two or three term labels, then uh, we can say that overwhelmingly, it's the passive articulator that gives you the name for the type of articulation. I can think myself of only one uh, exception uh, to it. Otherwise, uh, that is uh, the rule. The passive articulator, the bit that doesn't move, uh, gives you uh, the actual name of the articulation. Now, we then uh, have to look at where in the vocal tract, the articulation takes place. And there you see well, uh, something which you will see increasingly today and elsewhere. You have a human head cut in half. So you can see what will happen to you if you misbehave on the course. Uh, so. And there are places uh, of articulation. Uh, and you can see that we can move all the way back from uh, the lips, uh, going all the, all the way back uh, to uh, number eight here, which is the glottis. Now, you have this information on your handout, and I'm going to go through place of articulation uh, now. So look at your handout, please, and you'll find uh, these terms that we need there. So you don't... You can take them easily from there. And you also have the diagram on your handout as well. So if we take number one, we have lip to lip. And there we have bilabial. Now, you can't distinguish easily between uh, the articulators in, uh, in the two lips. So there we can't easily say passive and active uh, articulator. Some people claim that the top lip is the, uh, is the passive. Uh, I, I don't think that's reasonable myself. I can't see any difference. If we then take uh, examples of that, we have pa, ba, ma, uh, and wa. Uh, the wa, a wa, is 
what we term a double articulation, because there is also um, a, an, an, another effect going on uh, elsewhere, that is to say, uh, at the number seven uh, category there, the, uh, the vela category, the tongue is moving up uh, to the uh, velum, to the soft palate. Um, so that we term then a double articulation, um, and this, this is uh, bilabial. For W, we would term this labial uh, vela. Number three, or, ooh, I see the bird, the, the notes have gone there the wrong way again. Uh, this should be uh, number uh, three, so correct the, uh, on the handout. If it is need, does it need to be corrected or is it right? Maybe I'll, is it it's okay. It's okay, is it? Oh, okay, well, forget what I've said, it's on my lecture notes. So uh, anyway, uh, correct, uh, uh, it, it's uh, just number one, you don't need to work. Right, good. Uh, labiodental is lip teeth, and this is for F and B. It's not a bad idea, as I say these, for you to say them as well, or to mind them at least. So try Afa. Afa. And that's lip and teeth. So it's the lower lip, it's the, uh, it's the um, active articulator. They're moving up, moving up to the uh, teeth. Then we have uh, dental, and this gives a tongue tip to the teeth, the tip of the tongue to the teeth. And this gives us the dreaded so-called TH sounds of English. They're not really all that dreadful. They're rather easy to make, certainly in isolation. Atha, everybody? And Atha. So tongue tip, and it's important to use the tip of the tongue uh, uh, against the teeth. Alveola, this is... Uh, the center, as it were, of activity uh, in uh, English. A whole lot of sounds, Shemasia. The tongue tip against the alveolar uh, ridge. So let's have a go there. Ata. Ada. Asa. Aza. Ana. Ala. Ara. R is a rather funny one because it's, um, it's termed post uh, alveolar. So we term that uh, post uh, alveolar because it's made uh, rather further back uh, on the alveolar ridge. Uh, post means after, and it's Latin for after, but in phonetic description, if you say post, you mean towards the back of the mouth. So towards the back of the mouth. If you say pre, then you mean towards the front uh, of, the, uh, of the mouth. And uh, the other thing about R, it's got English, R. there's a whole lot of complicated things going on about it, and the label, at least for many people's articulation of uh, R, including my own, it's, um, it's rather inadequate just to call it post alveolar. But more of that again next Monday. You see, all these things you can look forward to uh, <laughs> on, uh, on Monday, when you'll have a, a very, very exciting lecture. Uh, on... Uh, going on uh, with our uh, place descriptions, palato alveola. This gives the blade of the tongue and the rear of the alveolar, the ridge, in front of the palate. And this gives us the uh, shushy sounds for English. A sha, a ja. The two sounds we're going to call Africans, a cha, and a ja. So there you are, cha cha cha. Uh, and uh, palato alveolar is the term that I use, and I believe my colleagues on the course will, almost without exception, be using it. But um, some uh, uh, phoneticians use uh, a different uh, term for this. They call it post alveolar, um, which is rather confusing to my way of thinking, because then we lack an adequate description of the R. But in the International Phonetic Alphabet chart, you will see it there as post-alveolar. But I think I can say uh, almost, well, my colleagues here, are you all saying palato-alveolar? No answer. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, do you say palato-alveolar for these or post-alveolar? Post-alveolar more recently. Post-alveolar more. Well, you're, you're up to date, you see, and I'm not. Um, but uh, many of the people in UC uh, at least are going on uh, to, uh, saying palato uh, alveolar, I know this to be true. Uh, well, it depends then on what your uh, tutors decide to say. Providing you keep a clear categorization, then it's all right. Palatal is the front of the tongue against, against the hard palate. So we have here the y sound, a ya, everybody? 
Yeah. And the front of the tongue there is actually, it feels like the middle of the tongue. It's that, this part here. Uh, and it's in, in the middle of the tongue. We call it the front, but it's really in the, in the, uh, in the middle. Uh, and that rises towards the uh, hard palate, aya. Vila, the soft palate, this bit hanging down here, this soft palate has another term, uh, which, is, um, which is vilum. Vilum is Latin uh, for uh, a veil, um, like a bride's veil. And that's why, where the term comes from. And so soft palate and velum mean exactly the same thing. One of the troublesome things about phonetics, as I may have said before, is that you get two terms sometimes for the same thing, and then you also get one term, which, like onset, which can mean two completely different things. So sorting out the terminology is rather important. But when we have it as a place of articulation, then we call back tongue to soft palate uh, viva. And that gives us a ka, everybody? A ga. And the W is also made here. You also get this raising of the back of the tongue here. So, a wa. Right. We don't have a vila fricative in English. We don't have uh, a ha as, uh, as exists in so many other languages. But um, actually, quite a lot of people uh, can make this uh, vila fricative, a ha, uh, because they may uh, have it imported from other languages, like uh, Welsh uh, or um, uh, Scottish uh, Gaelic. Um, uh, or Scots itself, so the, the Scottish uh, accent itself has this ch sound uh, uh, in it. Um, other people find it terribly difficult to make, and so they make um, terrible pronunciations of languages which have a ch uh, in them. Um, but it's not, um, it's found in Welsh place names, the ch sound, it's also found in Scottish place names, but it's not really, we, I haven't put it on the chart, it's not a phoneme of English, it's uh, in the true sense, it's what we term a marginal phoneme. It's, a, it's an extra phoneme which some people use for special uh, purposes, like place names. Lastly, certainly not least, we have the glottal place of articulation. Once again, we can't uh, distinguish here uh, between a passive or active articulator. Glottal means the space between the vocal folds. And when we talk about glottal, then we're referring to uh, the state of the, the vocal folds. So this gives us in English one phoneme, aha, uh -huh, everybody, uh -huh. and one glottal stop, which is not a phoneme, but a, a very important uh, allophone. And that is... Ah, uh, ah. Uh. I hope you heard it there, it's in the middle. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Uh, and it's in the, uh, in the middle there of that articulation. It's if, you, if you lift a heavy weight, you make glottal stops. If you go, ah, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, a glottal stop uh, there. I usually throw out heavy things for people to lift, but we couldn't manage to bring them all along this morning so that you could all go, ah, uh, and then produce your glottal stops. Um, right, so this then is a uh, place uh, of uh, articulation for English. We also got a few more that we could include. I've put them in uh, on, the, um, on this uh, sheet here, uh, but they're not uh, actually English sounds, but we often use uh, them to refer to them. We often use them in ear training and so on. So you can have black at the back of the tongue to the uvula. The uvula is right at the end of the, um, uh, of the uh, soft palate, and it's a little piece of flesh you see hanging down. Uvula means a little grape in Latin. Indeed, it does look like a tiny little pink grape. And some of you may be able to make a uvula roll. Does anybody remember a woman called Edith Piaf, uh, uh, the uh, um, French singer? She wasn't a phonetician, but my, could that woman make uvula rolls. Uh, she made her career out of it. And she used to say, uh, sing things like, je ne regrette rien. Uh, and this r sound that she was making, whoever wondered what it was, it was in fact a uvular roll. See if you can make it yourself. <laughs> Very useful if you want to imitate a motorbike, you know. <laughs> this is how I think I learned to make it, you know, in my youth imitating, imitating motorbike. We also have uh, a pharyngeal, which is tongue root to the... Uh, pharynx wall. I'm not going to dare to make this sound because uh, it's, uh, it, it sounds rather as if one's uh, being sick. Any, um, anybody here who um, uh, speaks Arabic? No Arabic speakers? No? Ah, yes, can you make the island for me? The island? Yes. 
And the, the other, uh, uh, are these other sounds there? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm not sure that she's making them actually. I don't think she can follow what I'm saying. <laughs> what I can do is make retroflex sounds. I'm very bad at, uh, very bad at uh, pharyngeals, I must say. How about my phonetician colleagues? Would they like to make a pharyngeal in public? <laughs> no, for, no comers, no comers. Uh, <laughs> so, retroflex is with the tip of the tongue curled back uh, against uh, um, uh, towards the alveolar ridge. So this is, uh, sounds like arta, everybody. Arda, and one finds these sounds not only in Indian languages, where they're very, very common, but also in uh, Indian English. Right then, so this gives us um, the uh, effect of place of articulation, which is our uh, second uh, component of our label. Our third component of our label is manner of articulation. Manner of articulation uh, gives us here you are, have a hand out. <coughs> Manner of articulation uh, is how the sound is made. Uh, the manner of articulation is classified according to the stricture. By stricture, we mean the narrowing or change of shape that takes place at a point in the uh, vocal tract. By stricture, we mean the positioning of the active and passive articulators so as to block or hinder or uh, alter, in some way or other, the passage of the airstream coming from the lungs, the pulmonic airstream. A rough analogy would be if you have water passage of the airstream, the sides of the tongue are lowered. And we'll see there that the natural approximant, as it's termed, uh, has the centre of the tongue making a contact, but the sides of the tongue are in the approximate, uh, approximate position it shows the lowered sides of the tongue. We can <coughs> say an L, and you'll uh, achieve this. Allah, everybody. Allah. Breathe in. Allah. Allah. And you should feel cold air coming in over the lowered sides of your tongue. And if you want to see what your tongue looks like, then you will see there a front view showing on the left-hand side, there, front view of the lateral L showing the sides lower, as compared with the D, where you have the uh, sides raised. So you have actually, also in an S, you have a channel down the middle of the tongue. So you have all these ways of arranging uh, the tongue uh, in, um, in making uh, these uh, sounds. But here, for the L, we have the lowered uh, sides of the tongue. We also have, this is called a lateral approximate, often referred to merely as a, a lateral because there's only one lateral in English, whereas there are several uh, approximates. So we often just call L the lateral. Um, then if we take uh, the uh, other approximate uh, sounds that we have, um, for which we don't uh, have uh, cross sections, except in the case of one, which is the R. This is the official cross section for R. I say official because uh, this is as it's described. So this is R, everybody. Ruh. Shall I tell you a secret? <laughs> the first person who explained this to me is sitting in the front here, and he told me many years ago, I don't believe these diagrams for, for R. He said the important thing is what happens to the sides of the tongue. He said it's the opposite of L, and I think Jack had called it contractive, didn't you? I don't know if you still use it. And Jack explained L to um, R to me much better than phonetic textbooks. For R, it's the sides of the tongue which are raised. It's like the reverse of the L sound. Um, and what you do with the tip of the tongue, well, indeed, you can do that, and you will achieve a good R sound. But I don't think it's the most crucial matter. But um, if you look at any book on phonetics, including the one I've written, actually, uh, <laughs> then you will see it described uh, in this uh, way. Let's have a go at saying English, are Ara, everybody. Ara. Again? Ara. What you can hear is it is an, uh, an approximate. So it's the resonance of the sound. The tongue is way away from uh, the uh, uh, roof of the mouth. Now we have some useful extra terminology, which I'm sure you'll come across. And that is, we can categorize, there's a chart which categorizes all these sounds. 
I get a little bit worried about these tree diagrams because sometimes I find they, they make me uh, more, I, I feel more worried at the end of it and uh, understand less than I did at the beginning. But I hope this one is relatively easy to follow. You have the constants, you can distinguish on this basis between obstruents and sonorants. Obstruents is a term to cover stops and fricatives. The fricatives uh, are categorized there, but the stops can be further categorized into plosives and affricates. If we take the sonorants, sonorant uh, is, um, uh, covers sounds which, have, which are sonorous, which have a, um, a lot of loudness attached. And they're really very like vowels. They, ca they carry the acoustic uh, in information. Um, and there we can divide between nasals, N, N, and N, and then we also have uh, other types of approximant, uh, so the natural L and the central approximants, W, Y, and R. Um, so there we have all the categories that we need for uh, uh, this category uh, of um, manner of articulation. And now I want to come back to the question of voicing. I promised you I would come back to this because now I can make a few statements because you have extra terminology. You have terminology like obstruent and sonorant and so on and so forth. So I can talk about it a bit, uh, and a bit uh, more easily. So here you have cover terms, stop, those of an advocate, obstruent, stops and fricatives, sonorant for the remaining types of sound. And then I can use those terms to cover the types of voicing that one has uh, in English. Sonorants, that's to say the nasals and the approximants are voiced throughout. So you have the vocal folds buzzing all the way through the sound. So if I say a word like um, man, my vocal folds are buzzing all the way through, fully voiced. Fortis obstruents, that's to say stops and fricatives, are voiceless throughout. Apa, abba. So if I say a word like uh, pit, it's only the vowel where you have vocal fold vibration. But when we come to the leanest obstruents, then we have a more complex situation. They're only fully voiced when they're intervocalic. So, for instance, in a word like bigger, the g there is fully voiced. But you notice, I hope you can see it, underneath the b, we have a circle, a little circle, which means the sound is devoiced. The, the vocal folds uh, don't vibrate for all the sound. <coughs> they're partially uh, devoiced uh, when they're syllable initial, as the onset of a syllable. So big, that's what I've just uh, said. But when you find them in coda position, and this is the more interesting one, because this is the one where people have the greatest problems, then we often find that it's fully devoiced. So that if you take a word like big, or a word like rise, say rise. rise. And some people were, many people were saying it absolutely brilliantly, uh, but some people were saying rise. And you had a nice, fully voiced Z. But if you get an English person to say it, you'll find they won't have that rise. They won't have the Z going all the way through. They're likely to say something like rise, rise. How do we know it's a Z, not an S? Well, if you compare rice, then you have this pre fortis clipping on rice, and you don't have that on rise. But the sound itself in this coda position. Uh, it's <coughs> fully uh, devoiced. Um, right, we now have one more thing which we have to deal with. And it's an extra, as it were. This is given to you as a bonus. And it's secondary articulation. So these are modifications that can be made uh, of the, uh, of the uh, um, consonants concerned. So you add a secondary articulation for the first. And as you can see here, uh, I've got a little bit more detail with examples uh, on the handout. But you can see here that you have three significant ones. Labialization, 
labial means to do with the lips. It's merely the addition of lip rounding. And we show it with a little raised W, as you can see with your uh, hand up. It's a misleading sound, uh, indication in my opinion, because it gives the idea, when you read the phonetic transcription, that you should say, twork. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, that's not what it is. It merely means that the T in talk, uh, or um, the example uh, which we have there, I believe, is, one moment, uh, the example, it is talk, oh great, <laughs> is uh, talk, but if you had twin, uh, which would be another example of a labialized T sound, then you'd have to uh, have uh, a W, and then uh, also, after the T, you'd have to have a little raised uh, W. Palatalization means the addition of front tongue raising to the hard palate. So here you have this in a word like tune, and you see little Y is following the T there, if you pronounce it that way. I must admit that I generally pronounce it as tune, but if you say tune with a uh, palatalized T, uh, then this is how you represent it. Velarization is the addition of the back tongue raising to the velum on the symbol. And there you put a wavy line through the symbol. So this is true in a word like still. And it gives us the sign that we use for the famous dark L uh, in English. That's the reason why we put that little line through it. It's because uh, this gives us uh, the effect. It shows that there's this velarization uh, effect. Uh, uh, on it, uh, as uh, well as the primary articulation, uh, which is, of course, uh, lateral uh, approximant. Um, right, well, I now have come virtually uh, to the end of uh, my talk. You can see that um, we've also got a little diagram there which shows you the locations of uh, secondary articulation. Um, but we've come nearly to the end of the talk, and it concludes our discussion of what I've called consonant possibilities, the classification and description of these consonant sounds. And of course, we've only been discussing these possibilities in relation to English, or almost only in relation to uh, English. If we were to take into account all the languages of the world, then we'd find, well, there's not all that much extra to say in terms of manner of articulation, but there are certainly very many more places of articulation, possibilities of lots of numerous modifications of uh, primary articulations by secondary uh, articulations, types of airstream mechanism, etc., etc. But we shan't concern ourselves with those for the moment. But later in the course, I think next Thursday or sometime like that, was it Friday, uh, Michael Ashby <coughs> is going to take you on a, a guided tour of the sounds of the languages of the world. That's something which you can uh, all look forward to. I am going to be seeing you all again on Monday, and on Monday we're going to have a look at the, an overview of the consonants of English and see how they function in the English language. So, see you on Monday. Thank you.